Hello everyone, this is Dr. David. Today we're going to talk about the coronavirus. So the title of this video presentation is What is the Coronavirus or COVID-19? This is a nursing review, so we will go over the symptoms, causes, and prevention strategies that should be in place in order to stop the spread of this virus. We will also discuss the pathophysiology of this virus as it goes through three different phases, and it is important to know those phases because in each phase, the patient or individual will present with different symptoms. So what is the coronavirus? The coronavirus, or COVID-19, first emerged in December of 2019 when a mysterious illness was reported in Wuhan, China. The cause of the disease was soon confirmed as a new kind of coronavirus, and the infection has spread to a number of countries around the world. The name coronavirus is a term that is used to describe a set of viruses that cause respiratory type symptoms, such as the common cold. Although the coronavirus is not new, as we have seen the SARS and MERS viruses in other parts of the world in the past, which are a form of corona, we have not seen this type named novel COVID-19. Remember that COVID-19 is a new strain of coronavirus, not previously recognized in humans. Now, what is the form of transmission of COVID-19? As you see from the slide, I have different pictures. I have one for mammals, birds, and a few people that I know that are my family members. Coronaviruses cause disease in mammals and birds. A zoonotic virus is one that is transmitted between animals and people. When a virus circulating in animal populations infects people, this is called a spillover event. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is now spreading from human to human. While animals are the source of the virus, like we just discussed, and it's now spreading from one person to another, there is currently not enough epidemiological information to determine how easily and sustainably this virus spreads between people. The incubation period for COVID-19, and this means the time between exposure to the virus and an onset of symptoms, is currently estimated at between 2 and 14 days. At this stage, we know that the virus can be transmitted when those infected show flu-like symptoms. However, there are still uncertainties as to whether mild or asymptomatic cases can transmit the virus. So how deadly is COVID-19? According to Dr. G, the WHO's World Health Organization's Director General, 80% of patients have mild disease and will recover. 14% of cases may experience severe disease, which include pneumonia and shortness of breath. Approximately 5% of cases will exhibit critical disease, which include respiratory failure, septic shock, and multi-organ failure. About 3% of the cases are fatal. The older the individual, the higher the risk. As of today, March 5th, 2020, Dr. G, from the World Health Organization stated that there are 92,943 reported cases of COVID-19 globally and 3,160 deaths. Currently, in the United States, there are 99 total cases with COVID-19 and there have been 10 deaths so far with 13 states reporting active cases. COVID-19 has surpassed the SARS death toll in a short amount of time, and although the death rate is much lower than SARS, it is spreading very fast. As of today, March 5, 2020, 80% of the cases have relatively mild symptoms because the illness begins and ends in the lungs. The remainder cases are severe or critical, mostly seen in older or immunocompromised individuals. Now, can you give me an example of a patient that is considered immunocompromised? An immunocompromised patient is a patient that has a weakened immune system. 
These patients have a reduced ability to fight infections and other diseases. An example of a patient that's immunocompromised is someone that had a transplant. Transplant recipients take immunosuppressive drugs, making them at higher risk of infection from viruses such as the cold or flu, and in this case, at higher risk of getting COVID-19. Remember that patients that have had a transplant take these medications in order for the body not to reject the organ that was transplanted. Another individual that may be at higher risk due to immunocompromised situation is someone that is taking steroids like prednisone because this is also considered an immunosuppressive medication. So let's first look at the name itself, Corona. Corona is a Spanish name that means garland or crown. As you see, the virus is fitted with protein spikes that stick out of the envelope that forms the surface and houses a core of genetic material. Any virus that enters your body looks for cells with compatible receptors. Those are ones that allow it to invade the cell, just like a lock and key situation. Once they find the right cell, they enter and use the cell's replication machinery to create copies of themselves. The assumption is that COVID-19 uses the same receptors as SARS, which are found in the lungs and small intestines. Why do you think this assumption was made? Well, COVID-19 and SARS share the following three phases. The first, viral replication. The second, hyperreactivity of the immune system. And the final phase includes pulmonary destruction. Now remember, there are three stages of COVID-19. During the first stage, which is early on in the infection period, it invades two types of cells in the lungs. These cells are mucus and cilia. Mucus cells keeps the lungs from drying out and protects them from pathogens. Cilia move the mucus towards the exterior of your body, clearing debris, including viruses. The preferred host of SARS, COV, which is a form of coronavirus, was the cilia. So it is likely the preferred host of COVID-19. So what happens if these cilia cells die? Remember that the function of cilia is to move the mucus towards the exterior of your body, clearing debris, which include viruses. So if they die, there's a lot of slough that's going into your airways, and then it fills them with debris and fluid. Now, what do you think are the symptoms that a patient may exhibit if the cilia cells die? Think about it. So if the cilia cells die, they are unable to remove mucus towards the exterior of the body. And remember, this includes viruses. So if they don't work well and the bacteria stays in your airways, it can cause breathing problems, infections, and the patient is going to exhibit a fever, cough, and all of this can lead to pneumonia. During the second stage of COVID-19, there is an immune response. Normally, when you are sick, the inflammatory process is very regulated. So it confines itself to the certain area that is affected. However, with COVID-19, the immune system overreacts and also starts to damage healthy tissue. Immune cells recognize the virus and rush into the lungs. When this happens, what do you think occurs? Think about the previous slide when we talked about the cilia's job. Well, more cells die and slough off into the lungs, which further clogs them and worsens the pneumonia. Remember that in the first stage, the cilia is unable to move the mucus to the exterior of your body, which clears the debris that includes the viruses. And this creates slough, which fills your airways with debris and fluid. During the immune response, it further causes damage, which worsens the pneumonia. 
During the third stage of COVID-19, respiratory failure may occur. Patients that reach this stage can incur permanent lung damage and even death. Lesions similar to those infected with SARS can be seen, which look like holes in the lungs just like a honeycomb. And this may be due to the overactive immune response that we talked about previously, which also creates scars that stiffen the lungs and may require the patient to use a ventilator to assist in breathing. Another thing that happens during this stage is that the alveoli become permeable. Remember that alveoli are an important part of the respiratory system because its function is to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules to and from the bloodstream. These tiny balloon-shaped air sacs, like grapes, sit at the very end of the respiratory tree and are arranged in clusters throughout your lungs. If there is an increase in permeability, this causes fluid to leak into the lungs, which decreases the lungs' ability to properly oxygenate the blood. In severe cases, so much fluid comes in to the lungs that the individual is unable to take a deep breath. What happens if the rest of the body is unable to receive oxygenated blood? What do you think? The patient will have multi-organ failure. So what is the test that's being used to confirm a positive result of COVID-19? This test is called the real-time polymerase chain reaction test, or RT-PCR. This test is intended for use with upper and lower respiratory specimens like sputum that is collected from persons who meet CDC or Center for Disease Control criteria for COVID-19. This is a quick test that can detect a very small amount of viral RNA. So who should be tested for COVID-19? If you have an acute respiratory infection, such as a sudden onset of either a cough and or a sore throat or shortness of breath, and in the 14 days before the start of your symptoms, you are either in close contact with a confirmed or probable case of COVID-19 infection, or traveled to an area where there is ongoing community transmission of COVID-19, or have worked or attended a healthcare facility where patients with COVID-19 infections were being treated. So what is the cure for COVID-19? Currently, there are no specific treatments other than treating the signs and symptoms of the virus through antiviral medication, respiratory support, and supportive care. The best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to this virus. Let's discuss some prevention techniques that will help you reduce the risk of spreading the virus. Number one, hand washing. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 30 seconds. If soap and water is not readily available, use a hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Avoid touching your T-zone, which include your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick try to stay away from them for at least six feet. If you are sick, stay home. Make sure to cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue and with your elbow flexed, and then throw the tissue in the trash. Make sure to disinfect surfaces regularly. Standard household cleaners and wipes are effective in cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched objects and surfaces. Avoid travel to high-risk areas and make sure you know and follow the COVID-19 policies and protocols of your healthcare facility. It is also very important that you thoroughly cook meat and eggs prior to consumption because coronaviruses are thermal liable which means that they are susceptible to normal cooking temperatures up to 70 degrees Celsius. Therefore, as a general rule, the consumption of raw or undercooked animal products should be avoided in order to prevent contamination. 
Now I get the question all the time. Should I wear a mask or not? Face masks help prevent further spread of infection from those who are sick to others around them. However, current data suggests that face masks do not seem to be as effective in protecting those who are not infected. Currently, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has recommended that healthcare providers follow the regular standard precautions and contact as well as airborne precautions and eye protection when caring for patients with confirmed or possible COVID-19. Make sure that you know how to properly put on and take off personal protective equipment in order to prevent self-contamination. And these two slides so show you how to put them on as well as the order of how to take them off. So let's make this a little fun. I know that you all love mnemonics. As this virus originated from Wuhan, China, let's use the word Wuhan as our guide for prevention. W, wash your hands often. U, use mask properly and when necessary. H, have your temperature checked every day for fever, especially if you've just traveled to Wuhan. A. Avoid large crowds and stay home if you are sick. And never touch your face with your unclean hands. So I hope that this video presentation was of great use to you. Make sure you put your comments down below. I will be looking through them and answering as many questions as I can. I will also be putting a quiz in drregisterednurse.com for you to go try out and see how much you remembered from this presentation. I also want to thank you for the overwhelming support that you have given me in this short period of time. The channel is growing and it could not grow without you. So thank you and again make sure to subscribe, like, and share so they can continue to grow. Well I wish you a great rest of your week.